good day. In my previous video, I had suggested that the evidence appeared to point to a slackening in the momentum of the Ukrainian offensive in Kherson region. Over the last 24 hours, that, um, what, that impression has now consolidated, and I think we can say um, definitely that the Ukrainian offensive has, in almost all places, come to a complete stop. In fact, such changes on the front line as there have been over the last 24 hours have been, from a Ukrainian point of view, in the reverse direction. There's clear reports now that the Russians have reoccupied some of the front line positions that they abandoned in the face of the initial Ukrainian advance and that this has happened in practically every place where the Ukrainians launched their attack. The only place, so far as I can see, where the Ukrainians have gained some ground and have retained it is in this bridgehead across the Igulets River in uh, close to uh, close to the ta the small town or perhaps better described as large village of Andreka and that seems to be the only place where the Ukrainians as i said have been, they've managed to some extent to enlarge their bridgehead but that's all that they have achieved they, this area of this bridgehead, by the way, also seems to be the place where the heaviest Ukrainian losses have taken place. And it seems that the entire area of this bridgehead is now covered by Russian artillery, which has been shelling both the various pontoon bridges that the Ukrainians have tried to throw across the uh, river, the Ingulets River, but also um, the Ukrainian troops who are located in this bridgehead. I have to say that given the scale of the losses, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the Ukrainian troops who find themselves asked to move from the north bank of the Ingulets River south to this bridge, bridgehead have come to see these pontoon bridges and pontoon crossings, not as the bridge to victory, but as the bridge to hell. Anyway, that's, that's the situation as far as I can see. I would say that attempts by U the Ukrainians to break out from this bridgehead have all been unsuccessful. And so far as I can see, its only function at the moment is to absorb Ukrainian troops and to create more <laughs> targets for the Russian aviation and artillery. Um, that, some people, by the way, are speculating, is the reason why the Russians have allowed this bridgehead to exist at all. Now, I don't know whether that is true or not. I doubt it, actually. But it is the case that Marinus, that US Marine officer, who wrote that piece for the US Marine Corps uh, Gazette a short time ago, describing the fighting in Ukraine in a very different way from the one that we've seen other people in the Western media describe it. Well, Marinus did actually at one point in this long article say that it was a tactic that the Russians have repeatedly used over the course of this war to appear to withdraw from a location to lure the Ukrainians into that location where they become more visible and lose cover and then to bombard the Ukrainians with their far superior artillery, inflicting heavy losses on Ukrainian troops. So it's possible that this is what has happened with this particular bridgehead. I'm not certain that this is the case, actually, but it's possible. Now, this morning, we got more reports, uh, very tentative and scattered reports of another Ukrainian attempted attack, but it doesn't appear to have amounted to very much. At least that seems to be the impression I have as of the making of this particular video. And from what I can gather, the Russians have already repelled this attack wherever it was 
and the Ukrainians have suffered further losses. So for the moment, it does seem as if this Ukrainian offensive in Kherson has failed in almost every respect. I have to say that the Ukrainians do still retain this bridgehead across the Ingulets River. Whether they're able to exploit it in some way, to make use of it in some way, we'll just have to wait and see. But so far, they haven't, as far as I can see, achieved anything. On the contrary, in nearly every other part of the front line, they've been thrown back to their original starting positions. And there was even a report earlier this morning, which, by the way, I cannot confirm, that the Russians have now uh, started their own counter-offensive, a counter-offensive on top of the failed Ukrainian counter-offensive, that the Russians have started their own counter-offensive, pushing towards the important town of Nikopol, major industrial centre, by the way, which is, by the way, the place from which much of the sell shelling of the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant has been taking place. But I will come to that shortly. Now, this is a very tentative report based upon a information provided by the Ukrainian general staff. Um, I'm not sure to what extent it is true. But whilst I'm on the topic of the Ukrainian general staff, one of the most curious aspects of this Kherson offensive is that it has retain, re, 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 retained complete silence from the outset about its progress. It said almost nothing. Um, to the extent that we've had any discussions or reports from Ukrainian officials about the progress of this offensive, they have all been from the political wing of the Ukrainian government. The Ukrainian military has been extremely tight-lipped about what, it, what is happening. And of course, we got that strange report yesterday that the Ukrainian authorities would no longer say which villages or settlements, they wouldn't identify which villages or settlements they had captured from the Russians, because that might render them into targets of the Russian missile and aviation forces. I've said that this seemed to me an absurd, uh, an absurd uh, comment, given that the Russians presumably know which villages and settlements the Ukrainians control and which they, the Russians control. But anyway, that was what the Ukrainians were saying yesterday and today. There have been further reports that there is now um, an instruction from the Ukrainian military uh, basically telling Ukrainian journalists and bloggers that they're not to report any further information about this offensive. So I have to say that the accumulating picture as of today is of an offensive that has come to a stop. Now, there's been some comments about this, even in the Western media. There's suggestions that, um, that there's been denials that the Ukrainian offensive has stalled. And, but that is the overall picture that we are seeing. And it's not surprising if it has stalled, or perhaps more properly, if it has been stopped or cancelled or called off, which is what I hope has happened, because it's now absolutely clear that Ukrainian losses have been as devastating as the Russians have been claiming. Now, the Russians have said that the Ukrainians have lost 2,000 men killed since the start of the offensive. And there are reports that the Ukrainians have suffered casualties up to the level of five to 6,000 wounded. Now, I don't know how accurate these figures are. I've said that I'm not able to confirm 
these numbers that the Russians are giving. But all of the information suggests that this is probably roughly true. There's now reports of people having to donate blood in places like Nikolaev, Odessa and Krivoy Rog, the Ukrainian held cities, the big Ukrainian cities, immediately to the rear of these front lines. There's now pictures of queues of people um, queuing up to donate blood. There's also stories of hospitals swamped by wounded soldiers f coming in from the front line. And perhaps the clearest, but also for me the most tragic and, well, tragic sign of how bad things are is a report from the western region of Transcarpathia in Ukraine. Apparently one of the brigades that was deployed to fight as part of this offensive is a mountain brigade. Uh, these are not mountain troops. They're not troops apparently um, um, trained to fountain fight in mountain areas. Transcarpathia is a mountainous region so that's why it's called a mountain brigade. Anyway, this brigade was basically made up of soldiers who were recruited in this region. So it was a region, a, a brigade drawn from this region of Western Ukraine. And it was equipped apparently with all the weapon systems that had been supplied to Ukraine by the West, the T-72 tanks from Poland, armoured vehicles from Hungary, sorry, from Holland, from the Netherlands, not Hungary, the Netherlands, these sort of places. And it was one of these brigades that was thrown into the battle. My understanding is that it was deployed in the fighting south of the Ungulets River in this, in this um, bridgehead that the Ukrainians have established. And exactly as the Russians say, it was apparently obliterated. Now, I'm not quite certain what obliterated means, but it seems that nearly all of its equipment was destroyed. Many of the soldiers were killed and many more presumably were wounded. And this region in Western Ukraine of Transcarpathia has apparently announced a day of mourning for these dead soldiers. So that, it seems to me, is both a deeply tragic story, but it's also, of course, confirmation that Russian claims of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers killed and wounded is true. Now, let's take a step back and think about the numbers that the Russians have been giving us. The Russian Ministry of Defense says 2,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed um, other sources, other Russian sources, are saying that Ukrainian losses in wounded have been between five and 6,000. Now that is consistent with what we're hearing from the hospitals in Odessa, Nikolaev and Krivoy Rog. Um, though, of course, the Ukrainians haven't provided us with exact numbers. And by the way, for what it's worth, it is consistent with that crude rule of thumb that I've seen some people apply that usually in battles of this kind there's three wounded soldiers for every one soldier killed. So if it is indeed the case that 2,000 Ukrainian soldiers were killed in the fighting then it would not be surprising if around five to 6,000 Ukrainian soldiers had been wounded. Having said that it is of course possible that those Russian sources that are coming up with that figure of five to six thousand are making that calculation. They're simply calculating that because two thousand Ukrainian soldiers were killed, that must mean that five to six thousand Ukrainian soldiers were wounded. I don't know. But I'm going to ride with this figure. I'm going to ride with this figure of five to six thousand wounded which seems plausible. If we add up the 2,000 soldiers, the, Ukra the Russians say 
Ukrainian soldiers, the Russians say they killed, with the 6,000, 5 to 6,000 wounded. Then we've had 7 to 8,000 Ukrainian casualties over the course of three days fighting in one sector of the front. That is horrendous. Now, Dima, at the military summary channel a couple of days ago, was saying that the Ukrainian forces, which had been committed to this offensive, numbered 36,000. I've expressed scepticism about that number, but if we're talking about 8,000 casualties out of a force of 36,000, that is over 20% casualties. Now, if, as I think much more likely, the true number of Ukrainian forces committed to this battle was significantly less than that figure of 36,000, I've seen numbers around 15,000 quoted. Well, you can do the sums. <laughs> now, given losses on this scale, I cannot see how the Ukrainians can sustain this offensive unless they pull in troops from other regions. And if they do pull in these troops from other regions, what makes them think that the outcome is going to be any different from what it was over the first three days. There are reports now from Ukrainian sources. This is before this media clampdown was imposed, but they're even sort of referred to in an article that appeared yesterday in the Daily Telegraph, that the Ukrainians have gone into battle <laughs> with a certain amount of tanks, of which they've now lost, well, around 130, and a few armoured vehicles, but mainly with unprotected infantry. They are massively outnumbered in artillery, and of course, in terms of aviation, they simply aren't even in a position to match, and they're in no position to match the overwhelming power of the Russian Air Force in this area. So it's not surprising if they've suffered these appalling casualties, given that these, this infantry, I've seen some pictures, by the way, of Ukrainian infantry, walking slowly across the open fields in large groups towards the guns. It reminds me, I have to say, of some stories I've read about the fighting at the Somme in 1916, but I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to discuss that further. But given that this is so, given that this massive imbalance in artillery and missile and air forces exists, why do the Ukrainians think that renewing an offensive over the open step, the, the fields of southern Ukraine, is going to achieve any different outcome from the outcome we saw over the last couple of days? So, I very much hope that wiser councils have prevailed in, prevailed in Kiev and the opposition to this offensive of the Ukrainian general staff of General Zaluzhny um, has been heeded. The fact that the Ukrainian general staff has been completely silent about this offensive strongly suggests to me that they're washing their hands of it and that as far as they're concerned, uh, they're disowning it. And that supports my belief that these reports of arguments and disagreements about this offensive are true. Well, that's where we are.
as of the making of this video. Of course, this is a dynamic situation, or at least it has been a dynamic situation. At the moment, as I said, things seem to be at a kind of standstill. Um, it may be that things will change. If so, I will obviously discuss it in my next video. But that's where we are at the moment. I will add one point. The West repeatedly talks about the Russian offensive in Donbass being at a standstill. And it's true, as I've said previously, that Russian advances there have been incremental. They've been gradual. And you could argue that, you know, if the Russian advance in Donbass is incremental, well, the fact that Ukraine hasn't achieved any breakthroughs in Kherson region in a few days is no big deal. I've seen some people make precisely that point. But there is a difference, which is that this Russian offensive in Donbass may be incremental, it may be slow, but it is going on all the time. The Russians continue to pile on the pressure on the Ukrainian defense, defenders in Donbass. Now, it's difficult sometimes to keep up with everything in Donbass, but over the last 24 hours, I've been continuing to get trickles of news of further Russian advances, further Russian assaults, further Russian missile and artillery attacks on Ukrainian units in Donbass, of Ukrainian units in Donbass continuing to suffer casualties. This is not a battle which is at a standstill. It is of a battle in which the Ukrainians are being hammered all the time, 24-7, and, uh, 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 and um, until, presumably, some kind of breakthrough or end to the fighting in Donbass is achieved. That is not the situation as of this time of speaking in Kherson region. At the moment, in Kherson region, there seems to be a situation where the Ukrainians have called off their attacks, and to the extent that anyone is attacking at all, it is the Russians. Though it should be said that the Russian attacks at the moment, if we disregard that claim about an advance on Nikopol, seem to be more to recover frontline positions than to actually launch further attacks on, Ukra on the Ukrainian troops. Anyway, th these are two very different theatres, and we shouldn't, it seems to me, um, conflate the two or assume that because things seem to be moving slowly in one place, they're the same as what is happening in the other. By the way, on a completely different topic, uh, one is hearing increasing rumours that the Russians are now using Iranian drones in Donbass. Perhaps they are. Again, I want to repeat, I haven't seen a single sign that that is actually so. And we're also getting more and more reports from all sorts of people that the Russian Third Corps or Third Army is now being deployed. Uh, the Institute for the Study of War says it's being deployed to Donbass, or maybe it was the British military <laughs> Ministry of Defence, I'm not sure which. Um, Others suggest that it's being deployed to Kherson region. I'm not going to say. I, I, I'll wait and see. I'll wait and see whether this third core even exists and what it amounts to when it does appear on the battlefields, if it ever does. But I just mention it. If it does come, if it does come into battle then of course um, it will no doubt make its presence felt in a big way and that will become ob all too obvious over the next couple of days and weeks. Meanwhile, I'm now going to return to that extraordinary episode yet that I was discussing yesterday, um, the attempt to storm the Zaporozhye nuclear power station. Now, I have to say this, when I discussed it yesterday, the whole thing seemed to me so bizarre that though overall, I did give credence to the Russian story. At the back of my mind, there was the possibility that the Russians 
were making it up for some reason, that they were trying to give an impression that the Ukrainians had been up to this kind of madcap affair and that this was a piece of Russian disinformation to discredit the Ukrainians in advance of the IAEA mission arriving at the Zaporozhye power station and that nothing like this had actually happened. Well, I have to say, I never quite believed that. As I've said, as I said in my programme yesterday, as I was careful to say in my programme yesterday, uh, mostly what the Russians say about the progress of operations over the course of this war has turned out to be reliable and accurate. And it's increasingly looking to me as if that is the case with this attack on the nuclear power station, or I should say attempted attack. The Russians have provided more information about this attack. Firstly, it seems that this force of 60 special forces units that were supposed to storm this power station was in fact only one part of the Ukrainian strike force that was intended to storm this power station. The Ukrainians also sent uh, a further force. Some people say it was about 300 men, which is, by the way, a much more plausible number for trying to storm a power station as large as this one. Anyway, that they sent this further additional force in two barges across the Kakhova Reservoir. And again, the Russians detected the barges and the entire Ukrainian force was basically destroyed. Um, I don't know how many were killed, how many were captured. But anyway, it's clear that the Russians are saying that this attempt to capture the power station was a complete disaster. And they've now provided photographs of these barges, which look, I have to say, hulking and rusty things. Uh, but anyway, there we are. And um, it, it does seem as if some sort of operation of this kind was indeed launched. I have to say that it, it really does have, for me, a very theatrical um, 60s thriller sort of feel about this. I mean, we, those of us of a certain age remember these films that were appearing in the, in the 1960s, The Guns of Navarone, The Heroes of Telemark, of course, all the James Bond films, in which a small group of determined heroic fighters capture the enemy's headquarters or fortress against impossible odds. And I have to say, this is what this whole operation looks like to me. Now, it may not be a coincidence that a lot of President Zelensky's advisers, and of course, President Zelensky himself, seem to have backgrounds in the movies, theatre and cinema. But anyway, it, it, it does look like a ludicrous operation and one which failed and of course if it's true that up to 300 men were killed or taken prisoner or perhaps more than that well a lot of brave men again have been sacrificed in an operation which to be frank can't have succeeded I mean anyway but there we go or must have had a microscopic chance of succeeding and it does make me wonder again about the quality, the calibre of the people making decisions in Kiev. Anyway, if the purpose of this operation, which by the way, the existence of which by the way, um, as far as I can see, the Ukrainian authorities have not denied. They've not said that it didn't, you know, that this isn't true what the Russians are saying which is suggestive, at least I haven't seen any such denials. Anyway, if the purpose of this in operation was in some way to interfere with the visit of the inspectors of the International Atomic Energy Agency to the nuclear power plant, they haven't succeed, that hasn't succeeded. The inspectors are there. Apparently they're going to make establish a permanent presence at the power plant 
and there's already Ukrainian complaints that the inspectors have been receiving distorted and false information from the Russians and that the information that they're getting is being manipulated, which suggests to me that the Ukrainians are nervous about the kind of conclusions that the inspectors are going to arrive at. Now, I don't know what the inspectors are going to say, but all I will say is that the head of the IAEA, Mr. Grossi, and his inspectors should be commended for their determination to carry out this inspection and to go to this power plant and to see what is actually there and to do so despite the many obstacles that have been put in their way. And I do hope that the presence of this in, these inspectors at this power plant will mean that these artillery strikes on this power plant now finally end. Anyway, that's where we are at the moment. The inspectors are at the power plant. Hopefully artillery strikes are going to end. Hopefully. Can't be certain of this. Hurston counteroffensive seems for the moment to be at a standstill, perhaps hopefully cancelled. Ukraine has suffered horrific losses. Horrific losses. The Donbass offensive that the Russians pursuing continues. And there's also reports that the attempted Ukrainian offensive in Kharkiv region has been disrupted by Russian missile strikes on the Ukrainian forces that were supposed to carry it out. And that offensive may also have been called off as well, though we'll have to wait and see. Perhaps it is unsurprising in light of this that there are now again rumours that some European leaders are trying to reach out to the Russians to find some way out of this crisis that they have landed themselves into. The Iranian government is saying that it is transmitting to Moscow some kind of peace plan suggested to them by a European leader. The Iranians have not f officially disclosed the identity of this European leader, but the Iranian media is saying that it is in fact Emmanuel Macron, the president of France. I have to say that what I'm hearing about this peace plan, and it's very spotty, but what I'm hearing is of a sort that makes it extremely unlikely to me that the Russians are going to be interested in it. But I suppose it's progress of a sort that someone in the West is now thinking of a peace plan. The only thing I would say is, I think almost the last person now whom the Russians will entertain a peace plan from is Emmanuel Macron. I think the Russians have become completely exasperated with Macron and I think unfortunately that he doesn't understand that. Now in the run-up to the war I was one of those people who was actually impressed by Macron's seeming efforts to try to avert the war. He was going to Moscow, he was calling Putin, he was having long discussions, he was coming engaging in enormously sophisticated and intelligent press conferences in Moscow after hours of discussions with Putin and he seemed to be showing a genuine understanding of Russian concerns in a way that no other Western leader at that time was showing and I thought that this was a genuine peace effort and I was encouraged by it and I thought it might come to something. The reality, as it turns out, at least from a Russian point of view, was completely different. It seems that Putin and Macron had hours of discussions in which Putin repeatedly asked Macron for details of his ideas, but was unable to pin Macron down. 
And apparently and eventually Putin came to the view, and not just Putin, but the entire Russian leadership, that Macron was simply stringing them along, that he had no real plan to offer, no real ideas behind his um, elegant words, that his peace proposals were merely a smokescreen uh, to cover the fact that Ukraine was not prepared to fulfill its obligations under the Minsk agreement and that Ukraine was going to proceed with the attack on the Donbass that the Russians uh, saw happening. And I'm afraid that that has destroyed Macron's credibility in Moscow. I don't think the Russians have much interest in any of the current crop of European leaders. I don't think they take seriously any of them. I don't think they believe, for example, that Olaf Scholz, who apparently is also trying in some kind of way to reopen some kind of dialogue with Moscow, I don't think he has much credibility in their eyes either. And of course, the Russians cannot have failed but to notice the quite bizarre, extraordinary comments of the German foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, Baerbock, in which she said that she was prepared to continue with the sanctions policy, with the pressure on Russia, with the economic war against Russia, no matter what, however bad things become in Germany, however, many, however strong the protests are in Germany, she, for one, is committed to supporting Ukraine, as she puts it, to the bitter end. Lavrov has already ridiculed these comments, pointing out how deeply undemocratic they are, showing a disregard on Baerbock's part for the German people and their opinions. And But the Russians will also see that Within the German government, within the current German government, there is, to be straightforward about it, a totally implacable anti-Russian core, which is still there and which is showing no, no sign of changing its policies. On the contrary, it seems that the G7 countries are still intent on pressing forward with their... Um, oil price cap idea, one that's been ridiculed by economists from almost, almost every economist that I can see, one which the Chinese and the Indians, the major buyers at the moment of Russian oil, have made it clear they have no interest in. Despite all of that, the Western countries seem to be pressing ahead with that disastrous idea, as they're pressing ahead with pretty much all the other sanctions that they've announced against the Russians. So I don't think that the Russians at the moment are in any mood to entertain negotiations for the simple reason that I don't think they trust the current makeup of European governments. It's going to have to be some new person who takes charge, who is going to negotiate. And I think people like Macron and Scholz need to try to understand that, that their credibility in Moscow has blown apart. The only way that they can perhaps recover some of their credibility is by making concessions that are far more far-reaching than the concessions that they are prepared to entertain at the moment. And at the very least, they have to tell the Russians that they are now willing, for example, to seriously negotiate and, if necessary, agree to the draft treaties for the pullback of NATO forces to the 1998 positions that the Russians presented to um, the Western powers 
in December last year and probably to cancel the inclusion of Sweden and Finland in NATO. If Macron and Schultz were prepared to say something like that, then I think the Russians would listen. And I think the Russians would also listen if Macron and Schultz also were prepared to make substantive concessions, very substantive concessions over Ukraine. Recognize Crimea, for example, this part of Russia, recognize the independence of Donbass. I don't think that people like Schultz and Macron really have any credibility to conduct negotiations for anything less. Whether they understand that, I doubt. But perhaps they ought to be starting to do so. And perhaps starting to say to themselves that if they really want to bring this conflict to an end, they need either to entertain concessions on that scale or, if not, step aside. Well, that's all I'm going to say today. Uh, thank you for joining me today for this programme. I look forward to you joining me again in future programmes on this channel. Remember that you can find all of these videos, as well as the videos we do for the Duran and Alex Christophoro's videos, on our other platforms, Locals first and foremost, but also Rumble and Odyssey and um, Telegram, our Telegram channel. And um, remember also that you can support us via Patreon and Subscribestar and by going to our shop where you can buy all the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts and all the rest. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for the day. More from me soon and have a very good day. Until then.